Miracles have occurred throughout history, but are there supernatural answers for the emotional, financial, physical, and spiritual needs we face today? Miracles still happen, and in the next few moments, Sam Luke will share practical insights into knowing the God of miracles. Join Sam and the Victory Tabernacle Church family as we encounter a God who makes miracles still happen. Hello, Pastor Sam here, and you can make it. That's the title of the message today, and that is what God has birthed in my spirit to share with you. No matter what you're going through, you can make it. Why? Because God is on your side. God loves you. He'll make a way where there seems to be no way. And if you're a child of God, just remember Romans 8, 28. God works all things together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. No matter what happens, God is still in control and God will turn it for your good and his glory. So today, I wanted you to know you can make it. In fact, I want to send you the message. All you have to do is call me, 804 744 8881. That's 804-744-8881. And I'll send you the message on CD. You can make it. So let's go together now into that service that's already in progress. And the power of God is moving. And I'm speaking on the subject, you can make it. Satan wants to sabotage and undermine your success because he knows that you were created the, to win. The potter intended for you to be a vessel of honor. And you were never meant to fail, to quit, to give up, to cave in. You were never meant to be destitute, to be isolated. God says that you're blessed. If God says it, that's enough, isn't it? Amen. Just tell somebody, say, you're blessed. You, you just tell them, say, you don't even know who I am, do you? You're blessed. I saw a thing on Facebook the other day. You know, I'm Facebook sheriff, and they had on there, said, if you share this, money will come into your life. You ever seen that thing? And it told me how much I was going to get. I shared that with everybody. I ain't got another red cent. I put, went back on there. I put, if you get an extra job on the side, money will come into your life, apparently. But God says you're blessed. Just because somebody on Facebook says you're blessed doesn't mean you're blessed. But if I can show you where God says you're blessed, would you accept it? Deuteronomy chapter 28, God said, if you diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord your God and keep his commandments, when you go out, you're blessed. But when you turn around and come back in, you're still blessed. That's if you don't know if you're coming or going, you're still blessed. If you're in the city or in the field, you're blessed. He'll bless your basket, that's your checking account, and your store, that's your savings account. He'll bless the work of your hands. He will command the blessing and the blessing will overtake you. Your children, your grandchildren will be blessed. Why? Because you are a child of God. And God says, beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as thy soul prospers. God said, I'll make all grace abound toward you that ye always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Hallelujah. We are blessed. Hey! Somebody tell your neighbor you don't even know me. I'm blessed and you don't know about it. You're blessed today. God made an investment in you and that's why you didn't die in that car wreck. That's why you didn't die with that heart attack. That's why you didn't die when the doctor said you would, but you didn't. That's why you didn't lose your mind and take your life and end your life, even though the devil told you there's no use to go on, there's no point. God said, I got a plan for you, and I'm making an investment. And if you can hear my voice right now, you are created by God Almighty to be blessed, to win, and he has a high and lofty plan for your life because God don't make no junk. <laughs> Hallelujah. Come on now. Ooh, if I was sitting there where you are, I'd be shouting right now. 
No good preaching when I hear it. Jesus is sent on a divine mission. He stated it in Luke 19, 10, for the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. He only has three and a half years to get together a crew. So he starts looking for disciples, and he goes down by the Lake Gennesaret, and he finds Peter, James, and John. Now, this is Jesus I'm talking about. This is the one that created all things. All things were made by him. Without him <clears throat> was not anything made that was made. He stood on nothing and said, let there be, laid the foundations of the earth. Stretched the line upon it to determine the measurements thereof. Shut in the sea with doors, made the clouds its garment, commanded the morning, made the dawn to know its place. Jesus could turn the water into wine. He could raise the dead. And what does he do? He goes down by the Lake Genesaret or the Sea of Galilee and picks three losers for disciples. You say, why in the world would he do that? Same reason he picked you and me. Because he sees a witness and a warrior. He sees something the world doesn't see. And he knows your potentiality. And that's why he chose you. But he chose Peter, James, and John. And he goes down to the lake shore, and they're out of the boats, and they're washing their nets, and the Bible said they caught nothing. Now, what's wrong with that picture? Why would you wash nets that have not been used? You're frustrated. You're frustrated. I didn't catch anything. I worked all night. I'm washing these stinking nets, even though I didn't have a fish in them all night. And Jesus comes by. He borrows their boat, pushes out from shore, you know, and preaches a little bit. He didn't bring a sermon. He was a sermon. And so he gets through and he begins to minister to Peter, James, and John. He said, did you catch anything? And they said, no, we fished all night and hadn't caught a thing. He said, well, why don't you launch out into the deep? Now watch this, folks. The Lord knows more about your stuff than you know. Some of you want to serve the Lord, but just in an advisory capacity. Some of you, you give a testimony. It sounds like it was you and God working the whole thing out. Mostly you. Well, I told God, God, you got to do this. Listen, you don't tell God what God has to do. He already knows what he has to do. He's just waiting for you to bring your life into alignment with his word. That's all. You do that, everything will work out. But here they said, now, Jesus, we know you're not a fisherman because we've never seen you around here. And we've heard about you, but we know one thing for sure. You're not a fisherman. You don't catch fish out in the deep water. You trap them against the bank. So you don't know what you're talking about. Launch out into the deep. I believe what Jesus was saying was this. You've been hanging around in the shallows with shallow people. Shallow thinking. You need to get out in the deep water. I know where the fish are because I created them. Amen. And I know where they are. And if you listen to me, I'll show you where they are. And then and I like this. He said, nevertheless. Mm, some of us need to get that in our vocabulary right now. Oh, Lord, I know I, I told you how to do it. And I know I said, I, I've got a plan. Lord, but, but nevertheless, it, not work, it didn't work the way I thought. But nevertheless, Lord, whatever you tell me, it's your word. I'll do it. And sometimes it seems like it doesn't make a bit of sense in the world. But nevertheless, nevertheless, said, I'll do it. And they launched out into the deep. And they threw out, now watch this, the net. The net. Not nets. Jesus said, cast out your nets. What net did they throw out? The rotten one that they had thrown up into the bow of the boat that they weren't even washing. It was so bad. They didn't even bother to wash it. They pulled that out. So this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. Not the nets, but the rotten net. They threw it in the water. Now watch this. I believe that faith requires me to give it my very best. If God ever tells me to do something, I can't do it halfway. I've got to do it to the best of my ability. Not that God is impressed with my ability, but he certainly wants me to give to him my best so that he can use it for his glory, right? So they threw this old rotten net out, and when the fish got in it, it broke. They didn't even wash that net. It was worthless. Have you responded to God? Have you been obedient to God? Have you asked yourself, am I doing all 
that I can do. Another thing is this. Don't be offended when God tells you to do something. Don't be offended. used to be that if somebody preached the truth, people appreciated it and said, hey, that's helping me. One woman came up to me one time. She said, my arms are so tired from listening to you preach. I thought, has she lost her mind? I said, what do you mean your arms are tired? She said, you've been sawing limbs out from under me all night, and I'm just climbing higher. <laughs> A woman called me today, and she's in her 80s. She doesn't get out anymore, and she didn't know I was on the phone. I was in the, the uh, media room when she called, and I, all the other phone counselors were busy, so I picked up the phone. And she said, I have a message for Pastor Sam. And I thought, oh, boy, I don't know what she's going to say, but I'm not going to let on I'm, I'm Pastor Sam because she might want to <laughs> rail me out. I said, what do you want to tell him? She said, I want to tell him, thank you for telling the truth. Thank you for preaching the truth. Thank you for telling it like it is. She said, I used to listen to him a long time ago when I lived in Lexington, Kentucky, and he was in Cincinnati, and I used to listen to him every Sunday morning. I said, well, you got Pastor Sam. Oh, praise God. Hallelujah. We had a, we had a reunion right there. <clears throat> but she said, thank you for telling the truth. Not many people will tell the truth anymore. They'll preach some kind of a sermon, but it's a modern gospel. It doesn't look like the truth anymore. People are, uh, preachers are trying to accommodate everybody's sin. They've come up with new names for old sins just to make people happy. But they're going to go to hell happy. I don't want anybody to be happy on their way to hell. If you're determined to go to hell, that's your business. But I sure want you to be miserable on the way so that maybe you'll say, there's something better than this. Amen. But anyway, she, that, was, that was exciting. Sometimes the Lord will tell you something that hurts your feelings. You know what? He said, uh, launch out in the deep. <laughs> Jesus, we know how to fish. We just hadn't caught anything. You don't think we tried? We're tired. We're worn out. That's why we're washing our nets, because we're tired. We're just tired. Some of you are washing your nets because you gave up on what God promised you. Your home's not happy, so, well, I guess I'll just get a divorce. And you're washing your nets. Well, he told me he'd bless me, but I, can't, I don't have enough money to pay my bills. I'm so broke, I can't even change my mind. Oh, and I don't know. I guess I'll just give up on that. And somebody else says, well, you know, my kids are so hateful anymore. I didn't raise them to be that way, but, but it's just too difficult for me emotionally to try to remain connected to them when they won't let me love them and they won't let me into their lives. And so you gave up on that. I want to tell you something. God has not forgotten his promises. If God told you something, he'll do it. I want to ask you a question. Do you realize that it's wrong to wash your nets? Do you realize that even though it might make you feel better because now at least nobody's looking at you and expecting anything from you because you quit and it's the spirit of failure and you're just saying, I'm frustrated. Do you know why it's wrong? Here's why it's wrong. Who told you God was finished with you? Who told you that this wasn't going to be the best time of your life? Just trust God to do it like he said he would do it. He told you something. He's about to give you back what you already gave up on. He wants your marriage to be happy. You heard Brother Van Druff 40 years ago. He got mad at Libby and drove off in a huff. What kind of a car is a huff? Is that something like a Studebaker? And he said, it, the Holy Spirit said you never apologize. Honey, I'm sorry. She said, I haven't forgotten it. They don't forget. They're like elephants. They don't forget. Women don't forget. Amen. Come on, girl. Say amen. You know I'm telling the truth. It's a gift. <laughs> Why don't you just go ahead and say you're sorry and get it over with. Amen. I'm sorry for tomorrow too. Amen. And for next week and next month. I'm sorry, honey. Praise God. And you know what? They know when you forget stuff, too. I walked out of the house the other day. And my wife said, well, what about today? Isn't this something that's, uh, this, I, just, uh, I, I just don't even know if you know what today is. I said, well, I, are you kidding me? I guarantee you I know what today is. And I got in my car, and I thought, I know it must be your birthday or something. <laughs> when is my anniversary? So I went to the office, and I said uh, uh, to my secretary, I said, it, it, could you check and, and see if I'm, there's something I'm missing this on today? Because my wife told me when I walked out, she said, I bet you don't know what today is. 
And she said, well, Pastor, well, you know it's not your anniversary, right? It's not her birthday. No, I don't think so. But I know it must be something important, something personal that, you know, I've forgotten. So I said, can you kind of call around, get me some flowers? I want to get some flowers. I may even go over to Macy's and get her a dress or something. I got to do something. Because I, I came in that evening and I had, I had a box under my arm, you know, with the dress and flowers. I said, hey, baby, I guess you... I guess you were wrong about me, weren't you? <laughs> you didn't think I knew what day it was. And she looked at me and kind of cocked her head sideways. She said, wow, so you knew it was Groundhog Day. <laughs> I said, yeah, and here's the flowers. Praise God. There you go. <laughs> you got to stay on top of things you want to have a happy marriage. <laughs> Praise God. Don't quit. You can always quit tomorrow, right? Don't quit. Turn your neighbor and say, don't quit. Who has told you that God is finished, that it's over, that God's not going to bless you? Everything he told you he'll do, he'll do it. It might be in the last hour, but he'll do it. My father was a tremendous man. I'll never live long enough to be as good a man as my dad was. My dad was a tremendous preacher. He loved God with all his heart, dedicated, loved his family, raised his family to love God, serve the Lord, loved his wife. I got notes and letters after they died from between my mom and dad and sweet love notes, and, and uh, they're precious. He was a good man, a good, good man. He pastored some good churches in his day. And there was a prophecy given over him when he was a younger man that he would preach to the nations of the earth. And the prophecy said people from the nations of the earth will be blessed by your ministry and by your prayers. And I watched him over the years labor, serve the Lord. But it never took him outside the United States, ever. I don't think he ever preached on foreign soil, not once. My dad said goodbye to his sweetheart, he called her, for 67 years. 67 years. Can you imagine being married to somebody 67 years? I knew a guy had been married that long. He called his wife Honey, Sugar Booger, Baby Doll. And I asked him about it, and I said, boy, that's sweet after all these years. He said, yeah, I got dementia. I forgot her name five years ago, and I'm afraid to ask her. But after my mother died, and they died six weeks apart, he lost interest in living. And he developed dementia. He couldn't remember everything. He played the piano. He was tremendous play the piano. He played the old honky-tonk style. <laughs> but he loved to play and sing. He used to sing, How did you feel when you come out of the wilderness? People shout, run aisles. Played the accordion, too. Could play the guitar, too. Pretty good musician. I didn't get any of that. I tried to be a musician one time, and, and I was frustrated. He said, I said, you reckon why I can't learn to play Musical instrument. He said, son, you don't have any talent. I said, oh, okay. Thanks for clearing that up. Because <laughs> I was wondering. But uh, he was dying. And they, my, my sister, he was living with my sister, one of my sisters, and she put him in the hospital. They told me about it. I tried to get down there before he died. I regret my last days that I'd never had the opportunity to be by his side when he passed, but <clears throat> it seemed like the dementia was worse, and sometimes he couldn't remember even where he was. But they put him in the hospital, and the first person to attend to him was a nurse from Trinidad. And she reached over him to do something and he opened his eyes and he looked at her and he said, Dear, I want to tell you something. Your husband 
when he left you, it wasn't because he hated you. He just couldn't abide the Jesus that lives in you. But you have let your light go out, and you're not serving the Lord. She backed up and looked at him, and she said, Do you know me? He said, I'm just speaking by the Holy Spirit. And he said, If you'll rededicate your life to the Lord today, God will make you gloriously happy in your life. She sat down by his bed and began to weep. She said, I was married for 25 years when my husband walked out and abandoned me, left me. I've been angry and bitter. I stopped going to church. I stopped praying. I started, stopped reading my Bible. And she prayed with him and the Lord saved her. She went down the hall and got a doctor from India. And she said, there is a man in that room that will tell you things about yourself. He said, oh, really? He walked in the room. He said, uh, hello, sir. How are you? He said, I'm fine. He said, come on in. I'll tell you what the Lord's saying to me about you. He said, you know the truth about the gospel, but you're not serving the Lord. You don't know Jesus as your Savior, but you can know him. And began to tell him some personal things. And the doctor sat down, took him by the hand, said, pray with me. I want Jesus to come into my heart. And my sister said that for the next three days, it was like the United Nations, Africa, Eastern Europe, all the islands of the sea, people in that hospital that had come from all these different nations came into his room and one by one they were saved. Some of them were healed. And he prayed for them in the last three days of his life and then he died. And she told me, remember, God promised that his prayers and ministry would touch people around the world. We didn't know that God would bring the world to his bedside. Some of you are thinking things are not working out the way I thought they would. Don't start washing your nets. God isn't finished with you. I want you to agree with me right now as we pray. It's time for us to touch God. I'm going to pray and I just want you to agree with me. Will you do that? Because I believe God has anointed me to pray a prayer for you that he will hear and answer. Heavenly Father, I come to you in Jesus' name for my friend. Father, I know someone is struggling. Someone is really hurting. But you have assured us in your word that we can make it. And you defeated the enemy for our sake. And you made it possible for us to be forgiven to be saved, to be healed, to be delivered, to be filled, to be blessed, to be an overcomer. And I claim that for my friend right now. Now, Satan, you take your filthy hands off God's property today. We're more than conquerors through Jesus Christ, for it's in his mighty name we pray, and amen. Hallelujah. I believe God heard that prayer, and I want to hear from you. Please call me right now, 804-744-8881. That's 804-744. 744-8881. Tell me about what God has done in your life, and I'll send to you this CD called You Can Make It. I want you to have it absolutely free. So all you have to do is call me one more time, 804-744-8881. Why not go to our website, victorytab.org. That's victorytab.org, and check out our 24-hour radio internet network. I think you'll be blessed when you do. Also, I wanted to remind you that every Sunday morning at 10 o'clock, two full hours of praise and worship, ministry from the Word of God, and always a time together in His presence around the altar. Last Sunday and every month is Miracle Sunday. That means we have an additional service at 6 o'clock. During the middle of the week, every week, here on Wednesday, you can find us in our Family Enrichment Night Service where we have something special for every age group and every member of the family. It starts at 7 o'clock. And at 8.30, we're walking out the door. One more time, if you like the message today that I preached, you can make it. I'll send it to you absolutely free. Call me at 804-744-8881. Until we're together again, just like this, around the Word of God, this is Pastor Sam reminding you that here at Victory Tabernacle, faith brings a victory, 
and miracles still happen. Gloria a Dios, que Dios les bendiga, praise the Lord, brothers and sisters in the Lord, this is Pastor Roca giving you a little bit of the Hispanic taste of what is happening with our Hispanic ministry in these days. I want to share to you that through the effort and for the glory of God, our ministry is well established both to the local level in the community and also to the state level. We accomplish this by doing different activities on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis, and three or four times a year we have major outreaches. Uh, through a sound doctrine, love and care for the needy, we've been spreading the good news of the gospel. And we are going to continue doing the same thing in this year, 2017, 17, which is seeking first the kingdom of God. And how are we going to accomplish this? By following the vision of our senior pastor, Sam Luke, continuing in the same uh, direction through outreaches, our Sunday school every weekend starts at 9 a.m. in Spanish, and at 10 a.m. we have our big celebration. Every Wednesday night, we meet at the chapel at 7 p.m. for our Bible study. Every first Sunday of the month, we start the month by praying and fasting at 7 a.m. and we do the same thing on the second Saturday of every month. And adding to all these activities, once a month, I go uh, to do prison ministry for the glory of God. Thank you for your time and your attention. God bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have any friends or family that live in the Richmond area, we would love to see you guys here each and every Sunday at 2 o'clock. We're going to be here from about 2 o'clock to 4. We're going to have food, clothing, a great time around the Word of God, some great worship service, and we really want you to be a part of it. It's going to be every single Sunday. We're going to be right here at Broad Rock Elementary School until the kingdom comes.